Thank you everybody for having joined us here. My name is Aninia Nadik. I'm the, um, the, I'll lead you through the session today. And um, I would like to start very simply with a few housekeeping elements. First of all, as I see you already do, please stay on mute. Also keep your camera off, that's easiest, um, certainly while you're not speaking. Um, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. That will give us a sense of who is there. That will give you a, a chance to, to state you're here. And any suggestions or comments you may have throughout this um, session, please also put it into the chat. There will be a brief question answer uh, element at the end, and um, we will um, go through the chat and pick out a few questions to put to the panel. And if, there's, um, if your questions have not been answered now, we will make sure that we'll find a way to, um, to answer them at a later stage. Feel also free at, the, at some point you will get a, an email address to contact um, the camp management people. Please feel free to ask your question there as well. So the discussion doesn't end at the end of this hour. Um, so we're talking about camp management today. And we all know that camps should really be seen as a last resort. We also know that in reality, camps and many other communal settlement um, options are often at the center of humanitarian response, and that there is, it's there that there are the greatest needs often centered in those, in those camps. And so we have standards, humanitarian standards, for many areas that we work in, technical standards, technical areas, and all those different ways of working, those, um, those technical sectors come together in a camp setting. Up till now, there were no standards for how to work in a camp setting uh, with all those various um, aspects of humanitarian work up, to, up till now. And now um, we do have um, a set of standards going forward, the camp management minimum standards. And um, these focus on the work of camp, management, camp managers. Those are those who are responsible for coordinating the delivery of protection and assistance in camp and settlement settings. Now, um, we would like to talk about those minimum standards today. We think it's they're a great addition to uh, humanitarian work. And I'm very happy to have three um, distinguished panelists with us today. Um, so that allows us to hear from several, from three different angles about the camp minimum standards, camp management minimum standards, and what they can do for, um, for camp management. Um, they will share with us the aspirations of the standards, both within the sector and beyond, and focusing on why site management is needed in a humanitarian response. The speakers will also talk about how the minimum standards were developed, and they will look at what came out of the field testing of these standards with examples where they have proved particularly useful. Again, after the presentations, there will be a short moment uh, for question answer, and then we'll wrap up um, with a few interesting pieces of information also about the next step um, with regard to the camp management standards. I would like to introduce our three speakers today. Um, we have Christian Gad, he is head of emergencies at Danish Refugee Council. We have Jennifer Quermo, capacity building advisor at IOM for the CCCM cluster and chair of the working group on the camp management minimum standards. And we have Tom Stork, 
MPACT Global Emergency Response Team member and co-chair of that same working group. Um, I would like to start with you, Chris, if you don't mind. And I would uh, like to ask if you could share with us your thoughts on why minimum standards were needed for camp management and what they will do for the humanitarian sector. Because don't we already have a lot of guidance? We have the camp management toolkit and so forth. Why do we need standards? Chris, over to you. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Aninia. Um, well, I think you provided, I mean, part of the answer in your, your initial pitch, but I would say that it, to, for many, it has historically been a little bit unclear what is actually the added of, of camp management and, and why is it really important? And as camps, is that really something that we want or need? Um, and, and so I think it's been also for the, for the sector at times, which is, I mean, if we take it from the cluster perspective, it's fairly new. It hasn't, it's, it's probably, so, so there has been a bit of a gap of, of clarity and, and maybe description of, of how concretely we, we add value. Um, so we, yes, we had the camp management toolkit, but um, there was need for additional guidance on, on, on minimum standards. Um, also, I would say related to the fact that if you look at the, the, um, the sphere standard, for example, there's no particular description on camp management, what we really aim at. So more of a predictable response across camp management between agencies and settings. Um, um, and also recognizability in what we what we aim at. But but let me also maybe try to argue a little bit in the wider sense why this is important, because the scope of the problem is, is really growing. I mean, global displacement is, is increasing. In 10 years, the number of forcibly displaced has doubled from 40 to 80 million people. And currently, there's also a record number of displaced people living in temporary settlements around the world. And these include camps, but also collective centers, evacuation sites, transit centers, and informal settlements. So never has it really been more important to elevate the rights of affected people living in camps to include, listen, and take into account the views of affected of people affected by, by crises. And we know that camp-based uh, displacement is most often not ideal, as you also spoke to, Aninia. And generally we, generally, we prefer freedom of movement and integration with local services uh, provision. But we also know that the extent to which camps or sites provides a protective environment differs substantially. It matters how we approach camp management. So in order to improve levels of assistance and protection, there's a need for a set of standards to help navigate and serve as a reference to measure the quality of work done by site management actors and field practitioners more widely. So throughout the years, key site management actors and field practitioners have recognized the need for shared guidelines and tools in camp management. This resulting in the 2004 camp management toolkit, toolkit and subsequently the establishment of the minimum standards for camp management. So with CCCM being a relatively new sector, the minimum standards will steer CCCM and camp managers to a higher baseline and help uh, define accountability to partners, and most importantly, to the communities that we support. It will put us in a position to be accountable to other sectors that we monitor in camps. And this joint goal of services coordination and monitoring will benefit, hopefully, both agencies and the affected people living in the sites. We acknowledge that camps and other displacement settings are part of a larger ecosystem of humanitarian response, and as such, I would like to highlight why our minimum standards will make a valuable contribution to the field of humanitarian assistance. First, emergencies do not always strike in places that are prepared. The standards will guide the people working, working in displacement settings on what to expect from CCM professionals and support site managers who do not have a long background in humanitarian assistance. Lessons learned from general or informal circumstances and field testing in some of the most complex settings Somalia, South Sudan, Iraq, and Bangladesh will help identify the best way of operating in a camp. The standards will help field practitioners to set objectives and provide a framework for monitoring the quality of the programming. Among other, the minimum standards in camp management will articulate an important but often underrepresented area of humanitarian assistance. 
mainly how women and girls who make up over 50% of displaced populations still often have their opinions unsolicited and unheard. This guidance has specific reference on humanitarian actors throughout the document uh, on how to build upon the opportunity to bring in the extremely valuable points of view of women and girls in their camp-based programs. So the standards, they're first and foremost um, designed um, or designated for the use by camp management agencies, but we hope that also the technical sectors working directly with displaced uh, people in the camps can have use of it. Equally so, the planners, the policy makers, the coordinators, and the donors. So that is really the hope uh, with the um, with the camp management st uh, minimum standards for camp management that they will add value to to the collective response and and through that uh, enhance the uh, the protection protection of the affected people uh, living in uh, displacement sites. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Aninia. Thank you, Chris. Well, that gives me a perfect opportunity um, after this uh, great introduction to move to our next speaker, uh, which is Jennifer Quenmont. Jennifer, um, you have been involved with the development of these um, camp management minimum standards from the very outset. And I wonder if you could share with us a few moments that you find significant um, throughout this um, development process, how that went. and and what, what sticks in your mind as, as important moments. Over to you, Jennifer. Sure, Aninia, thank you. And thanks, Chris, for um, really pointing out the, the, the gap that's been there in the minimum standards for camp managers. Um, you'll see displayed on the slide here some of the key milestones that we've had since 2018 when we really launched the working group. And when we launched the working group, we set out with the, the first goal was really to do field consultations to make sure that we hadn't just drafted a document that didn't have any relevance back with our colleagues who were doing the day to day work of having people um, complain to them, trying to make sure that partners were coordinating. Uh, trying to make sure that they really had good systems and policies and training set up in place. And so we, we, we took it on the road and we went out and did field consultations um, back when we could meet face to face. I get nostalgic thinking about it because we printed out big A0 um, standard by standard and, and sat around tables and had focus group discussions. And the goal of those focus group discussions and going on the road to the the places Chris mentioned, um, Bangladesh, Iraq, Somalia, South Sudan, uh, Turkey, was, was really to find out what was different from temporary site to temporary site. You've heard Chris and I say camps, but we actually wanted to find out from uh, persons who were managing large camps and little tiny transit centers, um, what was different between those two things? What were the core activities that the camp manager needed to be responsible for? We wanted to find out about context. So what was different from Latin America to Asia? What was different from Europe to um, to Africa. Uh, that's a really broad context and we tend to operate in emergency contexts, but they're really sometimes very context specific. So we wanted to see where the similarities were. We wanted to find out about different management agencies. So, so many times governments are in charge of managing camps and the civil protection are some of the first people who set up these camps. So we wanted to hear from governments, we wanted to hear from volunteers, we wanted to hear from big NGOs um, that we had lots of experience in this, um, like the Danish Refugee Council and um, NIOM, but we also wanted to hear from small national NGOs that maybe had never been given voice and had never been asked, what are the challenges that you face? What would help you get more guidance? Um, and then most importantly, we really wanted to talk to the people living in the sites themselves. And we had focus group discussions with the refugees and the IDPs who were living in the sites and asked them, would standards make a difference to you? So that was kind of the goal of our field consultations. And every time we came back um, as a working group, we debriefed what were the findings, what were the things that stood out? Um, how did that change the document itself? Where did we put more emphasis? 
And then um, following that, we were able to do some online consultations and we partnered with PHAP, which for those of you that don't know PHAP is, I have to like say their name, exactly correctly because I get their acronym mixed up. They are the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. And they helped us set, on, set up an online survey. And that online survey we ran at the very beginning and then we ran it as a validation at the end. And this partnership with them was great because PHAP has a much broader um, network than our working group and those directly related to the camp management sector. They have about 6,000 members who have expertise in a broad range of issues, including policy guidance. They had also done these types of consultations before. So Aninia, maybe we can pick your brain. They have done it with the um, SPEAR and they had also done it with child protection. And I think they had done it for um, ICRC when they set up the professional um, standards for protection. So they had they had a lot of experience with it and they and they were an amazing partner. So that survey, the online survey really looked at two different things. And that was how we had written them. So did the overall objective of having minimum standards achieve its goal? And then how was the structure linked to doing that? So we got a lot of feedback from those online surveys and we were able to reach into areas that we hadn't been able to do face-to-face -face consultations with, um, mostly into Nigeria, but we were represented in all other major humanitarian contexts. We also were able to, to survey a wide network of organizations, not just camp management specialists, but those whose work related directly to camp management. And that was really essential for us. Um, we, also had one special question, and again, I'm just going to highlight this because it was so meaningful to us, that um, we asked if anybody who had taken the survey had been displaced themselves. And we had almost 20% of the people who came back and said that, yes, they had been displaced and they were now working in the humanitarian field. And those, those answers were weighted differently for us because it showed both the credibility of how people who had to live in sites as well as people who had to do that job. So those were kind of the development um, of the minimum standards. And we had an editor who helped us to redraft them, but kind of it was a three year process and we just finished it in November. And I'm gonna show you the result now on the slide. Dun, dun, dun. So the structure of the minimum standards that we, um, we're able to derive from this consultation process and these surveys, um, to me is extremely special because um, as you can see, the, the structure really followed the, um, the core responsibilities that camp managers had. But starting at the top, you know, we went back and we revalidated the need to be a part of um, standing up for the, the role that camp management plays in a humanitarian context, that people running a camp, a displacement site, have a valuable humanitarian role, that this is not a sector that is in, um, that is, it is a technical sector in and of itself. Chris said it's new and it's new, but it's also recognized and highly valued. We also wanted to reaffirm that the protection principles are relevant and that as camp managers, we should abide by the protection principles as well as the core humanitarian standards which support quality and accountability. So we really started with that as our, as our foundation. And then from there, we were able to distill five minimum standards and you can see them uh, executed there on the bottom, it's the top blue square that represent what it would mean for an agency to bring dignity and to save lives for displaced persons. So we followed the same formula that Sphere has given us in that we chose to, to formulate our beginning opening statements as a um, statement of belief that camp management was there to inform dignity and uphold human rights. 
and accountability. And that you could do that through five different ways. And one would be having a really well capacitated team that had clear policies that respected the rights of displaced people to the best of their ability. And two would be that you would engage with the displaced population to hear their views and to make sure that they were well represented. The third would be that you were maintaining a site, it, a, an appropriate site environment that was really as physically and socially and culturally safe as it could be. Four, that you would provide monitoring and coordination with service providers. And that monitoring and service coordination um, is through all the different tech technical sectors meeting together and joining together to, to form joint site plans, as well as with the displaced population. And then the last would be that when you're closing or transitioning out of a site, that you're doing so in a dignified and safe way that supports displaced people that may need help during this change process. Um, a lot of times clamps close suddenly, so this was some very specific guidance. So, Maybe the last thing that I want to highlight is something that's not in this graphic here, and that's an annex that we have developed for the, the actual structure itself, which is um, looking at how disabled persons or persons living with disabilities um, could be more included within the um, activities that were core to camp management. So I guess I'll leave it there. Um, I really hope that people kind of get inspired by looking at this graphic and hearing these descriptions. But um, let me hand it back over to you and Ninia. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, I get inspired and maybe this is very briefly the moment for me to just say that in my day job, I work for Sphere and I also coordinate the humanitarian the Humanitarian Standards Partnership. And um, we have been working with Jennifer and one and others for a while now um, around the camp management standards, which has been great collaboration, cooperation. I want to thank you, Jennifer, and um, also say one shared the link to the standards, camp management standards in the chat. And with this great background that the two speakers now have established, I would like to suggest that we take a look at the application of the standards. They have been piloted in a few places. And I would like to ask Tom, if you could tell us about some of those examples um, where they have been piloted and how, how that worked, how were they taken up and how have they been used? Over to you, Tom, thank you. Yes, thank you. So last year at the at the CCCM retreat, the, the standards document was released publicly for the first time with the, 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 the caveat that it was in uh, a field testing stage. So it was considered a completed draft, but was going out um, for field testing. And so the question is, did the standards document um, just go on a shelf and, 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 and be forgotten about and become another document? The good news is no. Uh, we have seen through the working group a great uptake, a, a lot of interest, and particularly a lot of interest from people saying, well, we have the document. Can we use it? How do we use it? Um, and so I would I would like to run through three examples. It's certainly not limited to those examples. We have um, had other good case studies from uh, from Bangladesh and from Somalia as as as, 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 as well as others. But today I'd, I'd like to focus on uh, Sudan, uh, Mozambique, and and Iraq. For the first example, it is. Um, it is a little easier for me to talk about this one because it is my own as part of my role with the emergency team. I deployed to uh, Sudan in, in December of, of last year for the uh, refugee displacement caused by uh, the conflict in Tigray. There we saw a, a, a classic scenario of people displacing over the borders, um, two refugee camps forming, um, and what was most interesting is that in Sudan, both from 
in part from the UN, in part from donors, and particularly from the government, there is a reticence to have INGOs as, as, as part of site management support. So we use the standards uh, in part to help guide our proposal development, the fundraising, in part to guide using the common language of the standards, uh, the conversations, with, uh, particularly with the government, to say, well, th that classic question, what does a camp manager do? Or how can we support a government and UN-led response through site management support or, 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 or camp management? The good news is that um, DRC has become one of the first organizations to have a site management support role in Sudan. We are now actively working in, in that role in, in, in both camps. And the standards uh, in that example helped because of that common language, that ability to sit down and look at the standards document together and say, well, it, it's not, it, it, it's not Tom Stark who is just suggesting this idea that would be good because he wants to do it. It's because there is a document, there is a set of standards, and we can work. Um, we, we, we can work together on that. In particular, uh, standards around governance, the standards around capacity building were particularly interesting as a way of being able to articulate what we wanted to do through standards and indicators rather than sometimes maybe previously as suggestions, right? This idea, we have this idea. For Sudan, it was, we, we have these standards, we have these indicators and we want to help the response uh, meet them and, 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 and hopefully exceed them. So the first example I know is, is slightly cheating because it is my own and I should definitely be expected to do it through the, uh, as, as, as part of my role as the co-chair. So I can, I can move on to an example where actually um, we hadn't necessarily had a lot of contact um, initially with the teams. Um, and the team was IOM's team in Mozambique who were a little further ahead in the timeline of where we were in Sudan, where they were actively um, undertaking activities in camps, but still at a very early stage. And so a few weeks ago, myself and uh, Jennifer met with, um, with, with the IOM Mozambique team, and they showed us something that on, on, on face value is, is relatively simplistic, but for both for me and Jennifer is re re really a, a, an incredible achievement. And when we were both very much blown away by this, they had taken the standards and they had done what we wanted people to do, which was tear them apart, put them into a Word document, color code them as to um, these are standards or indicators that we are okay with in green. These are standards and indicators in yellow, where maybe we have to have a, a, m m more of a discussion. And indicators uh, or standards in, in red, where they were maybe unsure or um, maybe weren't applicable. And what was in, in, in incredibly promising to hear from that team is that they took the standards they had three meetings of around um, an hour each, so over a three hour period. They went through this process and could then confidently say where they were at in, 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 in the process of camp management. They could confidently say for site life cycle planning, as the example here, there is work to be done. Uh, but for maybe a different standard, okay, well, we're, we're on top of that one. Or for another standard, this one doesn't apply to us. Really building an operational uh, work plan and building a common understanding of where they were going, the direction and, and the strategy. And I think this is um, one of the reasons why we're highlighting, highlighting it today is that it is a fantastic example of people using the standard 
as it was designed to be used, pulled apart, questioned, um, you know, divided amongst focal points so that there was um, a common strategy, a common work plan, and, and, and an understanding of, of where they were going on that response. So a very promising example. Then for my third example, um, is, is, is a little different. Instead of looking maybe at the uh, wider coordination level, the wider strategic level, we, uh, we worked with and talked with the acted um, Iraq team who were facing amongst many other challenges of working in Iraq. They faced a specific and very troubling um, scenario where forced um, forced camp closures were taking place. And so they were given very little notice. They were given very um, little time in order to uh, prepare. And so from talking with the team, uh, our, our question is, how did they use the standard? From, uh, as, as they explained, they used the standard as a way of breaking down um, the problems of breaking down the situation into achievable um, goals, both in the pre-closure stage around advocacy. The standards um, includes a lot on camp closure, but also durable solutions and how those two things can work together. They then used it in the planning stage of closure um, by, again, being able to break down um the, the 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 problem and then right through operationally as they undertook and and and, and supported idps with uh with camp closure and and where for me the key takeaway from that iraq example is that the standards could be used as a um as a handrail right or a, or as a guidance um, when undertaking often, as we do as camp managers, very difficult, very complex um, operations. And, and they could use it throughout that process, not just at the, the, the strategy level, not just at the national level, but they could use the standards right down at specific camp level, but also specific camp level um, issues such as forced um, closure. And so the three examples, I, I think, as, as, as I've said, are all very, um, are all very promising. And are all of them have that common theme, which is teams trying to undertake camp management or site management support, looking at the standards, and, and not just having it as an academic or theoretical document, but having it as, um, as a way of supporting their direct operations. Um, and, 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 I, and I think that's very promising considering that they were only released publicly um, last year and, and late last year, right? September of, of, of last year. So um, hopefully more of these examples will um, come forward and, 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 and the working group can, can, can continue to support those, those efforts. Thank you, Tom. My microphone, thank you, Tom. That were, those were very inspiring examples. And my immediate reaction is, what will you do with all that awesome learning that that came out of those um, of those examples? And I want to ask Jennifer that question: How can you take those the key learnings from these pilots pilots, and to what extent can you actually integrate them still in the standards, or what else um, do you intend to do with them? Over to you, Jennifer, briefly. Sure, Aninia. Um, a couple of the examples that Tom didn't um, talk about, we've been able to incorporate from very specific guidance that we got with comments from a um, 
from one particular organization that was giving us examples for the guidance notes around how disabled persons could be better incorporated into evacuation centers, for example. Um, so we've been able to make some, um, some adjustments, but we've also been able to use it as a proof of concept. Um, and the proof of concept really comes from people who weren't involved in our specific piloting exercises during the cons or during the consultation phase and picking them up and saying, wow, this is really useful. Thanks so much for this. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so the, the proof of concept, um, we've also been able to use to help us to guide them and guide us in our dissemination strategy. Um, and really from people outside the sector and, and new people who were saying, you know, okay, how um, these are really useful and thanks so much for this. And, you know, here's one thing that I would, I would help you to um, refine a little bit better, so. Great. Um, thank you, Jen. We have, uh, I have a couple more questions, follow up questions to Chris and to Tom, but I just wanted to invite everybody to please um, put comments, questions, don't have to be questions, you, you can add a comment, uh, an observation you made based on, on what you've heard today. Um, and then we'll be there to, to discuss that over the next few minutes. Following on though, again, from what we've heard so far, um, Chris, I wondered, you have mentioned the need for protecting women and girls in your opening remarks. And I'm sure that the minimum standards cover other vulnerable groups as well, but which are those and how, how is that being done? And you're muted. Apologies all. I mean, why does that always happen? <laughs> um, uh, no, thanks. Um, I mean, in, in addition to, to what was also mentioned by, by Jennifer related to um, uh, people with disabilities and, and the need for, for enhanced attention uh, to that group, I mean, certainly, I mean, the standards aim at, uh, I mean, diversity more, uh, more, more generally. I mean, following on from the principles of, of uh, gender, age, and, and diversity more so, understanding more widely, I mean, who is the population in, in the camp, and um, understanding what their different uh, needs might be. So making, making sure that there's an understanding of what are the at-risk groups and what special attention might be, be required. Um, certainly also with regards to, uh, to governance and representation, making sure that, that there is equal representation by all, all relevant uh, groups in the camp. So I would say the standards will also mirror, I mean, the general humanitarian uh, guidelines as they are mutually agreed uh, related to, um, to at risk and, and, and principled uh, response and, and, and um, the relevant um, uh, diversity attention. Thank you, Chris. Um, Tom, I was wondering, just to clarify, um, they're called camp management standards. What is the, is, is that the scope? Is that the end of the scope of these standards? Or do they go beyond camp settings? How far can they be used? Where, in what other kinds of settings would they be useful potentially? Absolutely no. Um... Yes, it's certainly not restricted just to camps. It does raise the the uh, old question of, of what is a camp? What is then considered an informal settlement, a transit site, a reception center? Um, and certainly um, across that breadth of, 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 of what falls under CCCM, which is often itself uh, contentious, um, the standards can be used. One of the uh, case studies that are, or, or examples that we haven't, um, that, that I didn't cover um, previously was, was Somalia, where we have a higher volume of smaller, what we would consider uh, sites. And so the question is, if you have 2,000 discrete sites, how can the standards be applied there compared to say Sudan where we have um, for the GRC operation at the moment, uh, just two discrete camps. Um, and so, no, it's certainly not uh, restricted to just camp management. Um, 
it, 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 the, the, that that breadth of of of, of the typology of sites um, is uh, can all fall under the the standards. And I certainly remember as part of this this drafting process um, how much effort was put in to ensuring that the standards and indicators could be used in a let's say informal settlement of migrants in Tripoli compared to um, one of the one of the camps in 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 Bangladesh compared to um, sites in Yemen maybe where we access is constrained or or, or, or they're very transi transitionary in in the in the characteristics so no it's certainly not um restricted just to 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 camps but i mean ac across the board thank you tom thank you and i'm happy to announce that we do have a couple of questions and they're coming in that's great and i suggest that i will read them out um now and then the panelists will pick them up you can also um several of you answer one question there's no there's no um specific rule to that the first question is i heard that there was a um a fire incident in a refugee camp in bangladesh and my question is were such types of safety stand were such types of safety standards also part of these standards to ensure the safety from human induced hazards. The second question is, um, how can the standards be used in preparedness? And next question, are there any is there any reflection on how the standards are being considered in the new camps being established in Tigray? Um, Jennifer, do you want to start by taking a stab at these, at answering one or more of these questions? Um, sure, Anania, and and I'm I'm so grateful to have you as <laughs> as moderating this because I I think that when we get questions like this, it it, it helps to take a step backwards and to remember that the the incidents about fire or the incidents about um, fire is the easy, the easy one that was asked, but there was also one in the chat asking about the design of the site, um, is about creating a safe en environment in which um, people are provided with information, for example. Um, and they're provided with, the camp management agency is making a site plan to be able to prepare for um, how to spread information in the event of an emergency and that they have an evacuation plan that then incorporates the views and the abilities of the displaced persons. So I was quickly flipping through the, um, the document to be able to find where you could find the guidance on that. And so the first thing to do in thinking about the site plan and if it is safe for the persons living in it to be evacuated from the site is that the camp management agency has actually gone through the, the action of making a contingency plan and how have they involved the displaced population themselves to make sure that the, site, that the site is safe and responsive to the needs that the population has. So it's kind of a, a little bit back from that, but it's certainly, um, how do you work with the camp population so that everyone knows what is safe in the camp? How do you set those rules? How do you agree upon that together? So I hope that answers the question. Maybe maybe Tom has a more concrete one. No, I don't think concrete answers are ever really my forte. What, what I would say is certainly when we look at the situation of the fire in Bangladesh, um, uh, it's 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 across the board, right? The standards, I think, uh, can certainly help with issues of advocacy, looking at um, the camp environment, looking at durable solutions at that high level with that interface with the government. I also think the camp management standards can be used, um, as we have seen, by individual camp 
managers with their emergency response planning. Um, and, and certainly it can help there. And then right down to the operational uh, detail. So is there um, the, the, the correct setup in place? As Jennifer said, CWC, there's indicators on, on camp environment, there's indicators um, across the board that can be applied. Um, and, and certainly, yeah, and I think that is the strength of the standards, right? It can be used at this national level. It can be used at a very high um, advocacy diplomacy level, but then right the way down to um, individual blocks in a, in, a, um, in, 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 in a camp. And so certainly for the fire example, um, yes, I think applying it across the, the, the board. So yes, you ensure that there's fire extinguishers, but at the same time you're advocating for camp expansion or durable solutions or, or in, uh, larger improvements to the camp environment. And I think that's really where the strength of the standard lies. Thank you, Tom. Chris, would you like to come in? We also had uh, a question around preparedness and um, camps being set up in Tigray. Is there is there anything? Uh, thanks, Anina. Um, I mean, certainly, I mean, the human turn situation in, in Tigray is uh, extremely concerning and, and, ex and, and very challenging. And it, it's, it's, it's very true that a lot of, uh, I mean, spontaneous de facto displacement sites have been, been popping up where people are gathering a mix of collective centers and otherwise, uh, I mean, spontaneous uh, uh, sites. I think we're certainly right now, no, the, the minimum standards are not being applied, but, but I think as in, in terms of moving forward, I think we are in a, in a scenario that's close to what Tom spoke to in, in, in Sudan, where it can be used for, for advocacy purposes and in, and in, in early, early planning. So once there is full and in, unimpeded access to the displacement sites, working with relevant authorities, uh, state and non-state actors, um, in trying to set up and move you know, basic camp management functions, and move towards um, uh, applying the, the standards best possible in that very challenging standard. So I would say already, I mean, now in terms of preparedness, yes, it can be used also in that setting for discussing, I mean, if we are to do the best possible camp management under the circumstances, how can how can that look like in that context? So uh, yes, I can, I think it can be helpful both in the, in preparing for, so elements of preparedness, but also when moving into the sites, trying to set up best possible protective environment, quick as possible. Thank you, Chris. Um, I wanted to pick up on one element that that sort of um, is comes through in the questions, but maybe not as explicitly. It is the link to other other sectors, other humanitarian sectors, and camp management seems to me like a, a quintessential. Um, place where many kinds of sectors and um, and guidance and standards come together, which is why, um, from a from a sphere point of view, from a humanitarian standards partnership point of view, I find these standards extremely interesting, and um, it'll be very very interesting to work with them because we all somehow a lot of things come together there. And I wanted to ask you, Jennifer how you see this, this, um, this challenge or maybe uh, this, this great opportunity of working across sectors, across um, yeah, humanitarian sectors in camp settings. Yeah, I'm glad you said it was an opportunity because I really do think that's what it is. Um, and it was really challenging for us because for in camp management for so long, we've been training about about sphere and about other technical sectors because other technical sectors work in camp settings. And yet where the camp management agency's job starts and where we hand over and we rely upon the wash actors and the shelter actors and the protection actors and how we work together is, is so essential and so important. And we, we really tried to get it right 
particularly with shelter who um, do so much of the work in the beginning. And there was that question about, you know, the different layouts of the, of the sites. And I guess that's what I was thinking about. And shelter and, and, and CCTM work hand in hand and we need the technical experts. And so one thing I missed over in um, being nervous maybe at the beginning of the presentation talking about the structure was the cross-referencing that we do in it. And the cross-referencing was super fun because it was um, looking at Sphere and saying, okay, Sphere says more on this and particularly Shelter says more on this and Wash says more on this. And we wanted to make sure that the, that the integration didn't stop with what was happening to the camp management agency. And even to the colleague earlier in the chat who was talking about this, our government doesn't have any policies related to this. Well, you, you need to take these and then join them up with your policy. This isn't what we're saying needs to happen in every camp in the world. This is to get you thinking about where does my responsibility as a camp manager begin and where do I need to join up with somebody else? Where do I need to find that shelter colleague? Where do I need to find that government counterpart? Where do I need to find that voluntary agency who's doing that task already and join up with them and then make the rights of the displaced persons better and higher and represented represented in this temporary time which can be um, lasting forever. And you know, this, this Greek phrase, which is nothing is so permanent as the temporary, I think really relates back to camp management. And how can we make that better? And how can we work together with those other technical sectors? So I hope that answers the question. And, and there's a really extensive and fun index both at the back and in the front, so. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I, wonder um we have a couple questions here around consultation it's very standards get their legitimacy from a broad consultation base that's how they that's how they um are are developed and i wonder if you could say a few things about um how you consulted at different levels that would go from the from the global cluster level to um, local level to to um, local NGOs. How how what can you say about how that um, how the consultation process went? I thought I said too much about the consultation process already, but I'm happy to go back to it. Um, it it's about it's most it's okay. specifically about about how uh, local entities were involved in the in the consultation process. Also, thank you. So local local NGOs um, were part of almost every single consultation because if even if they're not the main site management actor, they're there providing site management services. So I would say that we had in every single one of the field consultations that we did. And I also, out of nervousness, kind of skipped over the online consultations that we did with small NGOs um, in Latin America. And we did those online um, during the, the first part of the 2020. Um, and those were mostly faith-based organizations and volunteers and civil protection in Latin America. So I, I think that there was large and broad consultation with over 850 persons um, who were feeding into the refining of the standards. But again, as I said in, in the first part of my opening remarks, um, that, that we did take the, the effort to be able to do consultations with displaced persons themselves. And those, and those were really essential to us in trying to shift the prioritization. And I would, I would further add in any of that the consultation doesn't end with the document that's there. Actually, it's the beginning of the consultations that the camp management agency does with the community and where they're working. And that is the primary goal of being an accountable camp management agency is really taking it, taking it back to the community where you're working and saying, let's work together in this. I'm here to represent you. What's your prioritization? And that's, that's all throughout the indicators, the key actions, and the standards themselves. Okay. Yep, and that's a very important uh, statement to make. And something that uh, once you've developed the standards is 
to some extent out of your hands, but it's definitely a, a message to be conveyed repeatedly that these standards are not the end point, but a sort of a starting point, sort of a, a baseline to work from and to involve all the people um, needed and in particular affected people and, and uh, local organizations, national organizations, national governments. Um, I believe there has also been a uh, start network consultation for these standards. So there's, there's another um, way of, of actually um, involving national structures. It's never perfect, but um, it, it's, it's a start and it, there's certainly a lot of excellent intentions that I picked up along the way working with the camp management people. Um, I, uh, yep. Oh, another question was um, a bit going back to contextualization and context is probably the biggest, um, the biggest challenge to work with any standards is to have global standards and translating those into context that makes the global standards a bit abstract, a bit short, and the richness comes with the context. And one question was, what's the difference then in applying the camp management standards in, in, high, in the high mountain, like in geographic differences, up, up high in the mountains, in arid situations, in, in very humid situations and so forth. How does geography play into the, 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 um, the, the the management of camps and, and also how to use these standards. Maybe, yeah, maybe I, Tom, I, yeah. I, yeah, maybe I could, I, I think certainly something that, that uh, I, I picked up during the, the, the drafting process and, and, a, and a lot of the work now with the field testing is that we found that as I previously mentioned, site typology, it, you know, small sites, large sites, transit sites, reception sites, the standards can, all, can, be, a, can be applied across that, um, a, a, across those site typologies and the same across um, uh, geographic differences. And so certainly one of the things that, that, that we have found is that Yes, you have to contextualize your standards to your location, to your camp setup, your site setup. Yes, to geography as, as, as well, as well as uh, politically. I mean, as the example that, that we talked about with, with, with Tigre, I think is, is interesting and reminded me of what are the examples that we talked about last year with remote um, monitoring of camp conditions in Syria. So camps where you, you couldn't have access to them, but were working through local partners. Yeah. And so I think one of the key selling points, one of the things that really sticks out for me for the standards is that regardless of whether you're in the high mountains or on the beach or um, down river, the, the, the standards can be applied um, you know, relatively straightforwardly and uniformly as well across those, Thank you. Uh, across different types of sites, different geographies, uh, different political situations. Um, and, and I do think that is one of the, the, the very sort of key things of, of the standard and something that we are hearing in, in the feedback. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, I pride myself uh, to be very on time. I'm Swiss. I have it in my blood, but I have to say that I got a bit carried away in the discussion. And I would like to give, um, ask you all to um, grant us two more minutes. We won't need more than that. I would like to hand over very quickly to Jennifer to talk us through any next steps, interesting things to look out for with regard to the camp, min camp management standards. And then we will um, wrap up. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer, over to you. Thanks, Aninia. I, I lived in Switzerland, so I also share that promptness. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, we're, we're so excited. I, we felt Tom and I, I think both felt that like after we had the draft of the standards out there that, that our work was done and oh, ho, ho, uh, that's really not the case. Um, we are looking forward this summer to, um, having the final version on the HSP platform. So there'll, there'll be a website that's interactive and an application that people can download onto their phones. We're um, drafting training materials. We are um, looking at monitoring and providing advice to cluster coordinators about how they can integrate the standards into HSPs and um, HNOs. And we really um, have just like the dissemination of using them and getting people to be more familiar with them. So if you'd like to engage in this process, I think my slide just, um, left us but if you'd like to be engaged in any of those activities the training the working group um using the standards and getting some guidance from the um from the working group and from tom and myself and all the other smart people that are part of it we'd love to have you um to have you join us so please do thank you jennifer huge thanks to you to Chris and to Tom for your presentations, for being here, for sharing your uh, wealth of, 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 of knowledge and uh, experience with us. Thank you for everybody who joined to listen in and to share your thoughts with us through the chat. Um, please, if you want to write to the camp management standards people, here's um, Here's the, the, uh, the email address and we'll also put it in the chat. It's simply info at cmstandards in one word dot org. And take a look at the standards themselves as well. Send us your comments, your thoughts. It's always good to, to be in contact in that way as well.